Hello and welcome back to KXAM Plus. Thanks so much for joining us here at the KXAM Plus studio. We are coming to you with our weather, uh, weather answers with Rich, with our KXAM meteorologist, Rich Siegel. Rich, thanks for being here. How are you doing? Good morning. It's a great day today. We had a really fine day yesterday with uh, the rain that fell. We had some yeah. high totals of a quarter to a half an inch plus. Most of the area got between one one hundredth and a tenth, but now we're set up for a dry slot for a few days. Well, for a couple of weeks at least. Yeah, that rain last night was a surprise to me, and it was a great little surprise gift for my yard and for my pets. They love to smell the rain when I open the windows. Um, they love it, and it, it just felt great to have a cool breeze, but also a little bit of water coming to our, our grass in our backyards. Mm -hmm. Um, today we have some questions to answer, but after our questions, we have a cool blog post that you wrote up and that we're going to... It's an easy one. <laughs> we're going to go over here on KXAM Plus, but let's let's go ahead and kick it off with the questions. Our first question is, what goes into the drought monitor? Good question. We appreciated getting that. There are a few ingredients that go into the makeup of the drought monitor uh, several variables. It's kind of like making a stew. You add this and this and this to come up with a great stew. And so for the drought monitor, a few of the things that uh, go into this are temperature, normal versus what is actually happening. Obviously, precipitation. That's one of the key factors in the makeup of the drought monitor. The amount of moisture in the soil. We had a lot of depletion of our soil moisture uh, from when we had all of that rain back in early July, the July 4th holiday weekend, and then we hadn't had much rain in the second half of July all the way through the first 23 days of October before those heavy rains came. The health of the vegetation is a factor that also plays into this. You know, how healthy is the vegetation? Is it too dry? Is it brittle? Is it dead? And so that goes into the makeup of the drought monitor. And then how much evaporation has occurred? And again, going back to what I said just about 10 seconds ago, all that rain that fell in early July, it started to evaporate because we had so much dry weather after July 15th going all the way out to October 24th. Who makes it up? Well, it's, it's a combined collaborative effort of three governmental agencies. The first one is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Everyone who has watched our weather shows has heard of NOAA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska. All three of these agencies are part of what makes up the drought monitor. They use firsthand op uh, observations from approximately 350 contributors. And so it's not just a few people that are making the drought monitor up. It's a combined collaborative effort of more than 300 to as many as 350 people. Now, this is the latest drought monitor, and it's worth showing because a couple of things happened. First, you see that the drought monitor from the previous week had a lot of red in parts of Hayes, Travis, Bastrop, and adjacent sections of a little part of Williamson, small section of San Marcus. Lee, and going all the way down to San Marcos, Lee, and then into Fayette counties. And then the monitor that was released to us on Thursday showed that the red had disappeared, and we were really happy about that. Uh, it's going to be back, however, with the lack of rain that we have coming up. But for the brief time, we went from an extreme drought to a severe drought in those five counties. And then we even had a, a little improvement going from a moderate drought, in, or rather, yes, a moderate drought in the hill country to just abnormally dry. So this is a combined effort of a whole bunch of people that look into variables that make up the drought monitor. Now, one more thing about this. The monitor itself is calculated from Wednesday to Tuesday. We get it on Thursday because they need time to build the graphics and to make sure that all of their numbers are correct. So those are some of the things that go into the makeup of the United States Drought Monitor. So it, there's a lot of people involved when it comes to putting out these types of maps and letting us know who's still in drought, who's gotten better. Correct. It's not just us here at KXA. No, right? we do not have anything to do with the drought other than dispensing the information that you need to know. And how often do we get updates on these drought monitors? Every week. Every week. And um, are they like from the beginning of the week or do they come out from that end of the week and report it in that? The drought monitor is calculated from Wednesday to Tuesday every week and then we get it on Thursday. Wow. Okay. How often do we use the drought monitor in our forecast? As often as possible. 
We'll use it all, you know, during most all of our shows on Thursday and Friday, and then I will use it on the weekend for those people who may not have been around a newscast you know, late in the week. Well, we have more questions. That one was just about the drought monitor, but our second one has to do with Nick talking about radiational cooling. Can you explain what radiational cooling is? This is a good question, too, because we had a few nights of that uh, recently, and we had actually another one last night. Radiational cooling is the optimal, it's an optimal cooling condition scenario where heat radiates into space. There are no clouds around, so the combination of a clear sky, the light wind, and we're talking about winds of less than five miles an hour or even that, and the air is dry. So here's a graphic that uh, we have that best describes this. You see in this particular scenario, uh, the ground, uh, the uh, sun hitting the ground, and you see those clouds just above. Well, what happens is those clouds act as a blanket, and they keep a lot of the warmth in. And so we don't see any of the heat escape until we get to the next scenario, which is this one, where there are no clouds and the heat escapes, it radiates into space, and uh, the air starts to chill even more, again, with the light wind and the dry air. And we're talking low humidity, which is what we have had. So an ideal night for cooling is the scenario on the right side. And for those that like the colder weather, we had a few of those last week when we had 30s and 40s, but this is... Uh, the ideal setup for radiational cooling where uh, the sun heats up the ground and then once the sun goes down, that heat escapes up into the atmosphere and has uh, no barrier to it. There are no clouds to prevent it from uh, continuing to leave. And what we saw last night was that um, little scenario on the right? Yes. Uh, last week. Last late week. last week. Last night we, we had a little bit of it. As some of the areas still had a lot of cloud cover this morning. Uh, when uh, just before the sun came up. But uh, tonight will be one of those where we will have that radiational cooling mm. because there will be no clouds in the sky tonight. The air, air will continue dry and will continue with the light wind. Nice. So we should expect some cooler temps tonight, right? Yes. Perfect. And our second question that we have today, or third, sorry, that was our second. When does Austin typically freeze? This one is a big one everyone's asking about right now. Well, yes. Um, now, let's just go into, for those of you that may not be familiar with this, the first freeze typically happen. well, not typically, it happens when the temperature <laughs> gets to 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, and that signals typically the end of the growing season. A hard freeze happens when it gets to 28 degrees, and uh, even with a light freeze, it can kill the tender plants. Here is the map of, that we have been showing uh, every year around this time that talks about the average first freeze. Now, keep in mind that these are just the average dates based on data that goes back in time. For parts of Mason and Gillespie counties, that first freeze could happen any time now. But actually, it already has happened because uh, either Thursday or Friday, I think it was Thursday, Fredericksburg's temperature dropped to 32, Mason's dropped to 31, and Lano dropped to 30. In that darker shade of blue, November 7th to the 13th, and we're talking about areas of San Saba, Llano, and Blanco counties. And then you go a little bit further to the east, western sections of Williamson and Travis into most of Hayes, and back on into Burnett and eastern Land Passes, we're talking the 14th to the 20th. In the lighter shade of blue, we're talking about most of Williamson and Travis, small part of Hayes, and then in all of our eastern counties, November 21st to the 27th. And then you see that little bit of red. Average first freeze at, in Austin at the Camp Mabry reporting station happens sometime between around Thanksgiving and that Thanksgiving time frame all the way to December 4th. But we did not have our first freeze at Camp Mabry until January of 2025. And so the freezes seem to be coming a little bit later in some areas. And this is because, you know, we talked about this in previous blogs where we had summertime lasting beyond its time cycle where we were seeing <coughs> summer-like temperatures in September, even into October. Mm -hmm. This past October, we had uh, a high of 98 on the second of the month, so we were still feeling that summertime heat. And Kristen and I did a weather chat about a month ago or so that talked about how summers are longer than we would want them to be which meant that the winter season was shrinking because the warm weather was starting sooner. So 
it may not come to pass that we see our first freeze in Austin in late November, early December. It may be delayed like it was last year. So it's important to remember that the average time is late November, but we may see that go even further into December, right? Yes, it could happen in December. It may not happen until January. We're in that developing La Nina pattern, which means that it conditions are usually warmer than normal and drier than normal. And if that's the case, and as this La Nina develops, it will just spell the fact that we are going to see another delay in that first freeze. And this will also mean that the allergy season, the pollens that are typical for uh, the fall season, we're talking about grass, we're talking about cedar. ragweed, not cedar, not grass, cedar. ragweed, and the molds may, well, the molds will always be an issue, but the grass and the ragweed may hang on a little more. Cedars are winter pollen, and so we that, that, that'll get off to its early start, I'm sure, and last, it could last a little longer because cedar thrives on the dry weather. Yeah, I'm already feeling my allergies start to spark up here in the fall yeah. season. Uh, before we move on to the next question, can you explain to me what the red on this map means? That's just a different color that was used to highlight Austin. And oh, okay. uh, you see down in the San Antonio area, the same thing. So like the city. Yes. Pretty much the, urban, city portion. The, the urban heat island effect known as known as Austin, Texas. And that's why our uh, first freeze at the Camp Mabry reporting station is a little later than all of the other reporting stations. The first freeze at Berksrum will usually happen in the latter half of the month. And we get our reports from, like you mentioned, uh, Austin Bergstrom and Pier Central in Camp Austin. Mabry. Yeah. Camp Mabry. The two Austin reporting stations are Camp Mabry. Uh, as far as the weather service is concerned, mm -hmm. um, now the Lower Colorado River Authority uses several reporting stations along its network of uh, gauges, and so we get a lot of information from them too. But as far as the National Weather Service is concerned, we get our information for Mabry and for Bergstrom. And are Mabry and Bergstrom often similar um, information that we get, or are they completely different? They're, 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 they're completely different. Uh, like this morning, Austin's low was 50, and at Bergstrom it was 45. Not that oh. great, but there have been times we had one day last week where Mabry's low was 54 and Bergstrom's was 41. It gets colder the further out to the east you go. Interesting. So keep that in mind. That's a one thing to remember. Our fourth question is, yes or no, are we done with the 90s? And I definitely want to know the answer to this one. All right. So uh, <laughs> the last day normal high temperature of 90 degrees usually occurs on September 23rd. This is from data from the last 30 years. The latest we've ever had a 90 degree temperature was on Christmas Day in 1955. So yes, we can have 90 degree <laughs> temperatures in December but it's rare. In November, over the course of a time and the, in that 30 year period, five days where, there, where the high has been 90 or higher. Wow. This month was, uh, this month the climate prediction indicated that there were going to be warmer than normal temperatures for November. Now, that just might mean 80s. So at the bottom line, I have said, well, Consistent 90 degree highs? No, we're finished with that. We won't have several days of 90 degree heat like we had in the first 15 days of October and then have a few more after that. <laughs> so this is my guess. This is my answer to that question. Are we done with 90s? We may have a few sprinkled here in November, but on the whole, we are done with consistent days of Yay. 90 degree heat. <laughs> Finally, we're over this 90 degree I heat. Hope, I hope that that holds. October people... did not feel like October this year. No, it did not. We and that's a rain. great lead in into the blog. Yes, then that is the topic of our blog, or your blog to be exact. And that one is on our website, kxan.com. It's titled, October was much too warm and far too dry. Yes, it was an easy blog to write. Usually, <laughs> uh, usually I'm the one in the weather office that will recap the month. But yes, we had 20 four consecutive days of high temperatures above normal, or as Kristen likes to refer to them, and I love when she says this because it typifies what that map is all about, uh, red box days. We had one day, <laughs> when we had that rain on Friday, Saturday, not yesterday, but the previous week, then we had one day where the temperature was right at normal, and it wasn't until the final three days of the month when we had our only yep. blue box days with that nice refreshing high of 69 on October 29th. And this just led into Chris, uh, Christmas. We Halloween. made that mistake <laughs> earlier too. That led into a wonderful Halloween yes. weather forecast that we had across the area. But unfortunately, 
as you go further down on this block, you'll see the you'll see the calendar that says only two days of rain, only two of the 31 days. Now, That's October right. is typically our slightest month of the calendar year with 3.91 inches of rain, and we only had 2.76 not a bad total, pretty close, but not what we wanted. But we knew that it was going to be a drier month when we had all this 90 degree heat. Yeah, we started off pretty strong with those 90 degrees, and then if you look back at that box, we only had one gray, day, one gray. That's box. a normal day. That's a normal day. So yeah. it was way below normal or above normal for us yes. in October. What else is in this blog? It shows the, the uh, standings of, for the month where uh, October ranked in terms of temperature, and uh, there it is, temperature and uh, precipitation. So in October, you know, last October we had our hottest or warmest, depending on what word you want to use, our hottest temperature ever. No. <laughs> the warmest October ever, if you'll just scroll back uh, up, up a little right there, it was our warmest October ever in 2024 with an average temperature or mean temperature of 78.1. Well, this tied for second, October 2025 tied with October 1937 for the second warmest October on record. And that coincided with the driest, uh, 69th driest October with that 2.76 inches of rain. Um, 69th driest, or if you want to look at it a different way, it was the 61st wettest. Mm. And we had a total of 2.76 inches of rain. Fall. Right. 1.15 below what we should have. Yes. And then here are some November numbers. November by the numbers. It's the fourth coldest month of the year, and hopefully that will pan out, although the month is predicted to be warmer than normal. And it's also one of the wettest months in the top half of the hmm. uh, calendar year. It's the fifth wettest month with an average precipitation of 2.92. It has snowed in November and in 1937, this is really kind of crazy that October <laughs> of 1937 was tied for the second. Well, now it is because of what uh, 2025 brought. But up until uh, this October, it was the second uh, warmest October. But in 1937, there were 11 inches of snow measured on the 22nd and the 23rd. Wow. Kind of crazy. Wow. Why I'm, can't we get that snow in November that's back? That's right. Well, <laughs> I think that's a pipe dream. <laughs> Well, we are excited to see what November brings for yes. us here in Central Texas, and we're glad we had a little bit of rain at the end of October. It's, it wasn't what we were expecting. Well, I mean, we were expecting a dry October, but not what we were wishing for, right? Right. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Rich, on this um, weather Q&A stream, and we are excited to see what questions you bring for us next week. Thanks, and don't forget, report it at kxan.com. To send in any questions or any photos or videos as well. We'd like to see those too. Thanks, Rich. Thank you.